I'm your host, Michelle Merchant Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I have with me here today a lovely and amazing returning guest, and that is Wendy Newman. Welcome, Wendy. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me back. It's good to be so, here. Oh, I'm so happy you're back. I love your work and really appreciate your contribution, and I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about today because I think it's going to help a lot of people. So before we jump into that, though, Wendy, I know so many people are familiar with you and your work, but I just want to give a formal introduction. Wendy Newman is a media-celebrated author and a dating, sex, and relationship expert who's led hundreds of workshops and revolutionized the lives of over 60,000-plus women internationally. She guides women to understand men, dating, sex, and partnership of all kinds. Since 2002, Wendy has interviewed thousands of men on relationships, love, dating, intimacy, sex, and the opposite sex. She's conducted polls, had one-on-one -on -one discussions, and hosted over 100 male speaker panels for these topics. Wendy is a compassionate fellow dater who navigated her way through 120 first dates before meeting her husband, Dave, lucky number 121. <laughs> they live in San Francisco. Her book, 121 First Dates, How to Succeed at Online Dating, Fall in Love, and Let Live Happily Ever After, really, is part juicy tell-all, part anti-rules dating guide, and it's been optioned for a television series and is getting love from the Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, Glamour, Self, Huffington Post, Access Hollywood, and more. So bottom line is we have a celebrity amongst us, and she's my friend. <laughs> it's true. I am your friend. And she's not going to forget about me as she becomes more rich and famous. <laughs> nope. Not even a chance. We're waiting for the riches and the fame. I'm ready. All right. Bring it on, baby. <laughs> so, Wendy, I'm really excited about this topic because I think this is something that comes up for so many women, and I can say you're probably the queen of first dates, right? You've got this whole thing figured out. So we're going to talk about how to get from second date, how to get a second date from the right guy. How to right. get a second date from the right guy. So first of all, tell me why you chose this topic. And I let's oh, jump in. Sorry, I jumped in before you were finished. That's all right. <laughs> okay. So I chose this topic because I think it's a very common question that comes up over and over from women of all ages. They have an easy time getting that first date or whatever, somewhat easy, whatever it is in that circumstance. And they'll get a first date after first date and no callbacks for a second date. And mm -hmm. I've done some research with men and I have my own experience to speak from, but most of what I'm about to give you doesn't come from my own personal experience on 121 first dates. It comes from what men have said about what they're looking for and what prevents them from asking for a second date. Mm, that's great. That's great. So you've definitely piqued our interest with that, Wendy. And so um, tell us, share with us some of the things that men have revealed some of the things they're looking for, some of the things that might have kept them from asking someone on a uh, out for a second date. Um, let's jump in there and and uh, give us a little little foundation to build on, if you will. Sure. So one of the things that I want to talk about is also what we're looking for. So I'll talk about what they're looking for and what we're looking for from an instinctual aspect. So you can kind of see it for yourself from your side. Now, most of dating is instinctual. We're rarely our best, natural, calm, flowy self that we are when we're, we're with our best friends. We're, it, the person we are when we're with our best friend and we're letting our hair down is usually not how we show up in the first 10 minutes of a date. You got that right, girl. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, hi, so good to see you. Oh, how have you been? Like, we don't show up like that. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And especially if we get there and he's really cute and we're all nervous now. And so we're nervous, they're nervous. 
you see your date and you think it's on. Okay. <gasps> how do I, how do I get this all to go well? Right. And there will be things that you start to look for in him as he's talking and revealing himself and telling you who he is. Right. So you'll have ideas about him. You'll be trying to get to know him. You'll be trying to see if you like him and is he cute enough and is he smart enough and all the things. So one of the, all the things is you'll be looking at, is he solid? Is he going to be a good, some women are looking for provider. Other women are looking for good partner. Other women are looking for good dad to my child or children, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some solidness that we're looking for in him. So the first thing we're looking for is, is he hot, charming, or cute, right? Or, or right. smart, witty, whatever your flavor of smart, hot, witty is, right? Mm -hmm. So is he hot, witty, and is he solid? So the, the first two parts that he's looking for is, are you his version of hot? Are you his flavor? Are you smart, witty, charming, and whatever package that, or the package that you are, is that a match for him, right? Is there enough in there of who you are to have him be attracted? So mm -hmm. there has to be some element of playfulness. Now, I'm not saying you have to be light and airy and an airhead. I'm not saying that. But you need to bring enough of your own natural, unique sparkle to have him see your charm and cuteness or your whip smart sense of humor or whatever it is that you bring to the table with your flavor of attraction. So one of the things he's looking for, duh, is he attracted, right? Right. The second piece, he's not looking for, are you solid and good dad material? <laughs> right. <laughs> but he is looking at, are you good mom material? Even if you're never going to be a mother. So what are your flavors of of nurturing what are the ways in which you nurture i'm so i just want to say first and foremost i'm not a mother i'm never going to be a mother and whether you're a mother want to be a mother or like me never going to be a mother this all applies the same okay i mean if you're going to be a mother and you are a mother there might be extra qualities he's looking for but all of us are being looked at from what do we bring flavor wise to the table as a nurturing, caring, compassionate person. And it doesn't have to be cooking or it doesn't. Thank heavens for that. <laughs> yeah, right. It doesn't have to be how your mother was, however that is. Right. So he's going to look at, can I get enough of what I need from her? Is she going to be able to, support and nurture me in ways that work for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share with you one thing that a man told me while I was interviewing him about this. And he said, you know, when I was young, I bought into that whole, uh, the way to a man's heart is his stomach. And he said, don't get me wrong. I love food. I love food. And I had a wife who was a really good cook for 15 years. She was amazing. And she never had sex with me. Mm. I'll eat at Taco Bell for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? If I can be nurtured in the area of having sex, which that's not, that's not the mother, obviously. That's, that's your little temptress self. But he said being tended to and cared for in, in the touchy-feely kind of way a back rub, a, a this, a that, right? So mother is nurturing, mother is connected. Mother isn't sexual, but it's, it's connected in that way. My own personal flavor of mother is I'm a really good listener. Mm. He'll, come, he'll come home to me, my, my partner will come home to me and he'll share um, what he's working on at work and the strategies he needs to employ and he'll bounce ideas off me for an hour and a half and then he'll get concerned. Are you okay to still keep holding space for this? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I will hold the space for you and I'll hold it all night. If it helps you figure out what you need to do to be amazing at work. 
Mm-hmm. That's a specific flavor of nurture. Mm-hmm. I don't have a whole lot of other nurturing qualities. Mm-hmm. I have compassion. So for me personally, listening and compassion, that's kind of it. Like I don't cook. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't baby. I'm terrible when he's sick. I don't make chicken soup, right? <laughs> so so it, you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to be the perfect nurturing, compassionate person. You just need to identify what is my own personal flavor of being nurturing to somebody. And the mm. first place, if you don't know where to look, the first place is to look, how are you with your friends? Mm-hmm. What can your best friend count on you for, like solidly? Mm-hmm. I think maybe, uh, th- see if you agree with me on this, as you're speaking about this, Wendy, and I think it's really profound. Uh, it strikes me that a big part of why a man might be looking for this in a woman is that it allows him to feel emotionally safe, emotionally able to share or express himself where, you know, Dave can come home, your example, and share what's going on with work, which probably includes at times challenges, frustrations, opportunities, or excitement or whatever, and know that he's really going to be heard and seen. Yeah. And so, and that makes it emotionally safe for him to share in that way. Whereas men really don't have a lot of opportunities with their friends or that kind of thing to express themselves in that way. It's like, Hey dude, did you see the last game? And that sort of thing, right? They don't bond or talk or share in the same way that we often do as women. Do you feel like that's a part of what we're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. And there's one really key component that I want to add in that, is the piece that makes me safe, which is whatever he says, if he says to me before he says it, the thing I'm about to tell you, it's in the tent. It's just between you and me, it's in the tent. We're inside the tent together. I'm holding the space inside the tent. And in the tent, whatever he says to me doesn't leave that space ever, 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 ever. I don't tell my best friend, I don't tell somebody else, I don't share it with a coaching client, nothing, ever. And and that's the piece. So being seen, being heard, but also knowing it's safe to tell me anything because I'm not going to reveal it to somebody else is Mm -hmm. where the real intimacy comes from. Mm -hmm. So you become that safe place. The woman in his life becomes that safe place for him to be vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then there's one third aspect that he's looking for. So he's looking for, are you his flavor of cuteness? Are you a compatible flavor of those mothering, nurturing qualities that he's going to need? And he's going to also look for who are you and what do you care about if you are running the world? Because if you're in, if you become his wife, you're running his world. Right? <laughs> if you were, if you were running the world, what are the things that you most care about and what's going to matter to you? How big is your vision for your world and how big is your world? And the answer, there is no right answer, big or small, white or thin. It's, it's you. And one of the things that we're often instinctually not willing to do is share that with the people we're dating, especially newly, because we don't want to be uh, in any trouble. <laughs> we don't want to seem like we're too much or that we have high expectations or that we're too demanding or that we're too this or not enough of that. Or right. So we'll often not share how big our vision is for the world with them, but they need to know that to see if they're able to align with that and commit to that and support that and have you be as big and great and empowered as you need to be to have, to have that world be moved in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think I understand what you're talking about here, Wendy, but can you give us an example to make this really tangible and accessible to women, what that looks like? Yeah, so it can be as simple as the vision you have is to be the very best CEO of your company as you can and to be 
a benevolent and wonderful boss to the people around you. It's a great vision. Or to be the best hairdresser in all of Sandy, Utah. Right? <laughs> That's your vision. Awesome! That's a great vision. There's going to be beautiful people with great haircuts, right? <laughs> and then there's the other visions like, I want to go to Africa and build, rebuild that village with 30 people. And I want to do that at least three times in my lifetime every three years. And also, I want to start fundraising for this other cause because it's important to me and it makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Another version of this, and for, I'm going to use me because why not, right? It's an easy target. Um, I didn't know until I was with Dave how totally important it was to pick somebody who could not only get behind my vision, but would stick both of his hands on my back and push me out into the world going, yes, yes, be big, be as big as you want to be. I got you. I got mm -hmm. it. Yes, you can go on national television. Yes, go walk on Access Hollywood. It's going to be great. Go do this other thing. It's okay that you said that thing. That's real for you. Be authentic. Right? Be weird. Be big. Be bold. Be disruptive. Mm -hmm. I got you. Huge. Mm-hmm. So he supported you. He believed in you. He encouraged you. It sounds like he even like pushed you a little bit. Maybe if you were doubting yourself or if you questioned something you said or that kind of thing. But I think what you're saying in terms of the date piece is when you share this, when you share what your vision is, then a man kind of gets to decide, you know, can I align with that vision? Could that work with my life? right? Are our visions, could our visions be compatible? Yeah. And it's not necessarily something that you have to roll out on a first date because it's absolutely fine to let things unfold naturally, but don't be so cautious that you're purposely not answering questions. If he's right there and ready to know if he's asking you and you're feeling that instinctual need to clam up because you don't want to be too much, don't give into that go ahead have it be organic mm -hmm. yeah i love that. that i think that's really beautiful so what what do men make up about women on a first date wendy they're gonna make up what they think you need mm, okay if, if he likes you if he really likes <laughs> you <laughs> if he really 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 likes you if you're like a 10 on a scale of one to 10 to him, he's going to do be say anything to land you and <laughs> pick up things that you need. And what, how men do this is they look in three different areas to figure out what it is you personally need. And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to look to his past and look at how he was trained by his family members and what society told him that women needed and what his mother had. And he's going to decide what women need based on society and growing up. You know, maybe, maybe his mom had a new car every single year and then mm -hmm. that's what all women need. So he's going to make up a all women need, no matter who I date, all women need this, right? So that's based on society and his growing up. Then he's going to also determine what women need based on his past relationships and failures. <laughs> what he couldn't provide the last one or the, one, the first one or whatever, right? So maybe his mother didn't have a new car every year, but his uh, second girlfriend did, and she expected him to buy it. So he's going to assume that you might need that too. And the third place, place he's going to look to, and this is the most important, the third place he's going to look to see what you need is he's going to listen to what you talk about. He's going to, if you're dating online, he's going to read your profile and he's going to make stuff up based on your homepage of your dating profile. Mm -hmm. So when you say, I love to travel, travel is very important to me. 
he's going to make up that you need to travel three months out of the year. And that because you're such an avid traveler, because you brought that up first, you probably need to go at least business class, maybe first class, uh, especially if you're flying internationally. And can he get that much time off of work? I mean, he only gets two weeks, but you need to travel a lot. You talked about the Galapagos Islands and you also talked about New York. And then you also talked about how much you love Rome and you go back all the time. I, I can't afford her. I'm going to pass. Mm -hmm. Or you taught, you show up in your gorgeous new BMW and he takes one look at that and thinks, I can't buy her a new BMW every single year. I can't afford her. Mm -hmm. So I'm not telling you to dumb yourself down or to not talk about these things or to not show up in your beautiful new BMW. <laughs> you be you and you be as big as you are in the world. And then you speak to what you need. Don't let him make it up. So... I'm actually not a huge fan of the I love to travel, which is in almost every woman's profile. Mm -hmm. It isn't a lot for sure. First yeah. off, it's overdone. So they've seen it all before. <laughs> and also because they make stuff up about you. I mean, I'd rather you say, I love the Galapagos Islands. It's my favorite place. And here's why. Sea turtles. Hello. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather you talk about the one specific thing or beach reading. Finally, I get a break. Yay. Right. And so, so they can kind of get a glimpse into you because mm -hmm. travel is super vague. Right. Travel could it's be like the, it's like the, I love to walk on the beach cliche, right? <laughs> exactly the same. Absolutely. Exactly the same. Big difference between camping in Yellowstone and trampling around Europe and Asia. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's not worth doing when there's so much more of you to share and reveal on that homepage. But, but back to um, what they're making up, you can show up in that brand new car. You can have those first class tickets in your hand, in your bag, when you go on that date and you can speak to, you know, I'm really grateful that I have this amazing job that affords me to do all these things. And I really like providing this for myself. And what I'm looking for, and again, you might not say all this on a first date, but you'll find your own way around saying what you need to say to be clear. I, I'm not looking for someone to provide for me in that way. You know, I can't rub my own back. I can't say, wow, poor baby, after a really long day at work. I'm actually looking for someone who has my back. I'm not looking for someone to put a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. Right. So you just want to speak to what's true for you. And if you're showing up in really big ways that you think he might make up that he can't afford you, you just need to clarify and he'll never ask. He'll just go away. They don't yeah. care. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is really true, and I think this is so important, what you're talking about. And it's almost like the men, if there are men that were listening to this, they'd all be, like, giving out the collective sigh of relief when you're saying, I'm looking for someone to rub my back, not necessarily for someone to provide all of these things for me. Right? <laughs> you can hear the men just go, ah. <laughs> Right? Absolutely. Well, I think another piece about this too is it's a way, it's a gateway for a man to uh, feel like there are things that he can provide that you would value, that you would appreciate, but they don't necessarily have to be those material things, the nice car. I mean, not, like you said, nothing wrong with that. But if they think that they're responsible for pri providing that and they don't think they can, then they're going to go packing. But, the, but by you sharing what you do want, what you do wish for, then it gives them a chance to say, oh, well, that is something I can provide. That's a way I could be important in her life and make a difference in her life, right? Absolutely. And I'm certainly not going to tell a woman how to live her life. If she wants a man to provide that, cool. But you should speak up about it so you can have them in or out very quickly instead of trying to roll that out slowly. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So <laughs> first dates, what's one bizarre reason that a man never asks a woman out again? 
Such a great question. We don't give them enough of a hint that we are a yes. Mm -hmm. If they asked us out, we'd say yes. And men, when I say enough of a hint, I mean, really what they need is a big flashing green light. Yes. So how you could give them a, a hint is you could say, this was amazing, right? Thank you so much for meeting me tonight. I had such a great time. And oh, the coffee, the coffee we had was delicious. Thank you for picking this place. I love this place. And wow, we talked a lot about your trip to Montepichu. I don't feel like I got the whole story. I am totally looking forward to more. Mm -hmm. I am looking forward to more, 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 more of you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes. You're such an interesting person. I'm so glad I got to meet you and I would love to know more. Yeah, so a flashing green light. This is not subtle. This is like I'm I'm ready for a second date. Yeah, they because do uh, I do not do subtle at all. You no, no. As I've interviewed men for my man panel series, one of the things that so many men have said over to me over and over again is men don't speak hint. And like, don't expect us to speak hint and don't expect us to be able to interpret that what you mean if you're dropping some kind of subtle read between the lines kind of message. Nope. And now I'm going to share a little story that might freak you out. And that's good. <laughs> so I freak was go ahead and freak us out, Wendy. <laughs> in my interviewing, I was talking to a man and actually, I don't even think this was an interview until he said what he said. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> you and I need to talk for a minute. But he said to me, and I am not kidding. He said, and by the way, this is like a 45 year old man. This is not a 20 year old, a 45 year old man said to me, I don't care how great the date was and how much she seemed like she wanted to go out again. If she didn't send me an email after the date, yeah, I never asked her out again. Oh, really? So he actually needed her to write and say, Hey, just like, you know, I just said that as you're saying goodbye, hey, hey, love to do this again. And then you go home and you write, dear Jeff, such a great night. Thank you so much for meeting up with me. Like whatever your version of that is, right? Looking forward to more. And after he said that, I never not did that because I wanted to, not because, you know, all men are like him, but I just never wanted to not have it be clear that I would say yes if they ask me out again. So literally it would be, dear Jeff, thank you so much for meeting up with me. Super great to meet you. You're a really interesting person and I'm looking forward to more. Or if you asked me out again, I'd say yes. I would yeah. wrote, I actually would write that. And I just wouldn't even feel bad about being that vulnerable if they didn't like me and they went away. Okay, I mean, what whatevs, right? Keep moving. So it wasn't any skin off my nose to feel like that was a risk because this is date. This is what dating is. And right. you know, if they didn't write back, okay. Well, and I think this is such a good point, Wendy. I'm so glad you're bringing this up and it didn't, it didn't freak me out because it actually makes a lot of sense from, if you think about it from a man's point of view, a lot of them have experienced a lot of rejection they're not always getting clear messages. They don't always know what a woman wants. They're trying to read the signals, just like we're trying to read the signals. And if we're not giving them that clear message and that green light, and they're kind of going, I don't know if she was really into me. I don't know if I want to put myself out there. And they've had rejection and disappointment too. Uh, you know, you can. it kind of makes sense why they would need that, that encouragement, so to speak. Yeah, and how many times at the end of the night has a woman said, oh, yeah, call me, and dodged it? Mm hmm exactly. So I want to ask you um, about another thing, like, what if a, and this is something we hear about all the time, you know, this whole ghosting thing and men disappearing after what seems to be a really good date and where it felt like there was a connection and maybe he even kissed you at the end of the date and maybe he said, I'll be in touch or I'll call you. And so she feels like the signals were already clear and then poof, he's gone. What do you say about that? What, do you, what are your insights or thoughts about that? 
Oh my gosh. It's so, so common, right? We hear this so all the common. time. It's so heartbreaking. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been there. It's horrible. So here's what I want you to make up that happened. Okay. <laughs> and, and the chances are it's probably true. Okay. okay. So you had an amazing date. You were into him. He was into you. You had just wildly interesting conversations all night long. You made out at the end of the night. <laughs> ah, you're so excited. And then ghost, right? Right. Here's what happened. He really liked you. You really did have an amazing date. You had a great time. And there was something about you two as a pair that didn't work. And he was overriding it and hitting the override button and hitting the override button because you are so amazing. He was batting that away so he could stay connected with you on this amazing date and was just going to override the thing. And then he got home and he was like, oh, she doesn't want kids. I really need kids. Or she wants six kids and I don't really want any kids. <laughs> or uh, I'm Jewish and that really is important to me or whatever it is, right? She, she's unable to travel because of her work and travel is like super important to me. So there was something around lifestyle that's big, right? Or something around where you are with your philosophies or life that really was a deal breaker for him, that it came up on the date, but he didn't care because he would have been done, said anything to be with your cuteness and hotness and amazingness and brilliance. Like you're divine. Why would you try and stop the, stop that? Mm -hmm. And then he got home and reconciled the information and went, damn it. And it doesn't occur to them to try and negotiate it because they don't want to change you because that would be rude. Mm -hmm. They don't want to check back in to say, really? Do you really, really never want kids? Really? They just, they don't want to change you. You said who you were and they are who they are and it's just not a fit. And it doesn't occur to them to call you up and say, hey, uh, we had such a great date and I think you're a really wonderful person, but I'm calling you to tell you that I'm not going to call you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't see too many men lining up for that phone call. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just, they, they figure you're, ha what they also don't know, and because because testosterone causes so much single focus in a man's body that they, they might think of us, but they don't have their attention on us the way we have attention on them. And it's not because we have low self-esteem or because we're infatuated or anything like this. This is strictly DNA here. This is strictly estrogen versus testosterone, okay? This is a man-woman issue. We have the ability to multitask. And in multitasking, we have the ability to have our attention on more than one thing. And even if we're really busy, let's say you're right in the middle of something huge at work and you've got a million things going on and you really don't have time to be focusing on why he hasn't called you back yet, right? But a little part of your brain is reserved for how's he doing and when is he going to call, even when you don't have time. Yeah. They're not built like that. So yeah. they actually, because they're not built like that, they don't understand what absolute torture it is for us to go from the weekend to Wednesday without right. a call. <laughs> like every minute seems like five hours. <laughs> right. So they just, they don't know how torturous it is because they're not built that way. So they also think, well, why would I call her with bad news when she's over there having a good day? I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I've sometimes said to women, I said, you know, sometimes men don't even know they've disappeared. Like in our minds, they've disappeared. To them, it was just kind of the natural thing to do, right? Yes. Yes. 
because they don't they don't feel it the same way. And yeah, I don't think from Saturday night to Wednesday feels like an eternity to eternity to most <laughs> like it does to us. Totally. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's so funny. That's so funny to think about. Yeah, and I think um, I think men because they're more logical, because they're more single focused, whereas we can be like you know uh, like in our brains, you know, bouncing all around and that sort of thing. Um, it is different for them, and they're more energy efficient. You know, they're they're like they have focused and channeled energy, so they're not going to put more energy or more time into something that's over in their minds, right? It's, it's already complete. Correct. In their mind, right. Yep. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, I can remember once I was talking to my husband and I was saying that I'd been talking to a friend and this guy had disappeared and, and she was like, I have no closure. I've got no closure, right? She wanted closure, which to her closure meant we're going to have a big conversation about it and talk and I'll understand and, It'll make me feel better somehow. And my husband just said, you know, he said, she has closure. She just doesn't have the closure she wanted. Correct. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of brutal, but it's kind of true. It's totally true. I did something. I only did it twice because I needed closure. <laughs> of the 121 first dates I went on, I only did this twice. Okay. But I needed it because it was, it was that thing. It was so amazing. And, but of course we were good. What happened? Right. Right. And he was going to be the one. <laughs> right. And until, until he wasn't. <laughs> until he wasn't. So I didn't tell it was Thursday. Right. Right. <laughs> and so what I did was I, and it only did it twice. I'm not a crazy person doing it every time, <laughs> but I am a person who likes communication. And so I wrote him, a letter, an email, and it just said, hey, Jeff, I always use the name Jeff, hey, Jeff, <laughs> I had such a great time with you. Thank you so much for going on a date with me. I haven't heard from you, so I'm going to assume that there wasn't enough interest for you to contact me for another date, but I wanted to take this opportunity to really say thank you, and I found you to be, and then I would share, I, I, in both of those two emails out of the 121 first dates. Uh, <laughs> those two emails were different, but they had, they started with that same format. And then I thanked him for how different he was than any man I had dated to this mm -hmm. day. It wasn't a long email. It wasn't like a long gushing email, but it was just a short, you know, thank you for being this and bringing this to date. And, and you're amazing and good luck out there. Mm -hmm. And the two times I did it, one of them wrote me back and one of them didn't. And I didn't do it for the right back. I just, the minute I hit send, I had closure. Yeah. You can do the same thing. And instead of hitting the send button, you could just rip it up. <laughs> you to write it down and rip it up or send it to junk or, or send it to him. I don't, I don't care what you do. Uh, so, so it, the right back, the one who wrote back, he, it was very sweet. He wrote back and he said, you know, that was very sweet. And, and you're absolutely right. I live in San Francisco and, and you're living over there in Oakland and, and I have to commute to Silicon Valley every day. And I, I have a child that I also have to pick up and see. And, and you living just that far away is just too much for me to add into an already crazy schedule. And if you lived on my side of the bay, we would be dating. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that thing. Yeah, so that comes back to the story we can tell ourselves about a date when a man disappears, because you gave a perfect example of what happened there with this guy. He, you did have that amazing connection, and then he got home and he thought about the reality of what it would be like to date someone in Oakland with his child and with his commute, and he decided that was too much. Yeah, can I tell you one other? Absolutely. First date number 10 of 121. <laughs> he and I dated for a while and it was a typical date for a while and then it was the slow fade. You know what I'm talking about by the slow, yeah, fade. Yeah. slow fade. And then he was gone, boop, gone. And he made my book. So 28 of my 121 first dates, 28 of the dates made it into the book because there's little short vignettes, right? Of the actual dates. And so his date story made it into my date 
into my book and he was the only one who made it in who I was not still really good friends with and connected to, right? And so, but I knew how to reach him through LinkedIn. So I sent him a little message and I said, hi, remember me? Um, <laughs> I wrote a book <laughs> and you're in it. And the good news is it's very complimentary. And let me send you this chapter. There are some men in the book that did not get this. I, I hope they never read the book. <laughs> but I sent him the, I sent him the thing, right? And it, and I went on a book tour. I was in 20 cities and he had moved on to Washington, D.C. And he found out that I was, he kind of did his own homework and research. And he said, hey, I see you. I'm looking at your site and I'm looking that you're going on a big book tour. And I see you're coming to D.C. Let's, let me take you out to dinner. And I said, well, I'm married. but And he's like, yeah, I know. It's cool. Let me take you out to dinner. You're on a book tour. I said, great. So we went out to dinner when I was in D.C. And he said, can I tell you what happened between us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess. <laughs> Can I eat a few bites first? <laughs> right, I'm like, I thought we didn't fade. <laughs> right, he said, and now this is the one that I'm gonna give to all you ladies. This is your forever answer, because it could be true. He said, when I met you, and we, it was a really great first date. And on the second date, we had so much fun. But you were such a grown-up. And by the third date, what I could see was that you were the real deal. That you were my opportunity to stop being a boy and step into being a man and have a real relationship for the first time in my life. And it scared the hell out of me. You were the whole delicious gourmet meal and I wasn't ready. Mm. And I failed. And he said, I have wondered about it for years if I made the right call. So that's what you can tell yourself. I am the entire gourmet meal and he disappeared. That means he was just out for ice cream. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's the best one ever. I love that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so glad you shared that story. <laughs> That's wonderful. And yeah, I mean, what a, what a lovely closure that turned out to be, right? Yeah, totally. Unexpected closure. I want to thank you for always being so generous in what you share because you're really open hearted and generous with your wisdom and experience. And you always provide, you know, some really valuable, tangible takeaways in these interviews that women can benefit from right away. And also, we have a great time and a few good laughs, which also makes it really super fun for me. <laughs> so, thank you for that, too. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. I really always love being with you. It's so much fun. And I'm glad that you pull out stuff that hopefully will help our women uh, have an easier time out there. Yeah. So we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Bye.